I'm not necessarily proud of what I do. I just happen to be really good at it. And I earn a lot of money. There's nothing stereotypical about my job. I, I kill people for a living. That's the bare truth of it. But I'm no psychotic or psychopath. I, I'm very much sane. Well, as sane as anyone who does this job is. I'm a contract killer. So for my own, uh, protection. Let's just call me John Stone. There's nothing remarkable, really, about how I came to be doing what I do. You might think that it's the typical broken home, left with no choice scenario, but that's not it. I came from a comfortable upper middle class family in Florida. I attended university there and I even graduated with honors. It was while in college that I discovered my very special talent. There was a gun range a few of the guys liked to go to. I tagged along a few times and although hesitant at first, it soon became clear that I was a natural. I was a dead shot. And so my nickname from that day on was Deadshot. Then came that fateful day when I really found my calling. A couple of the guys had organized a trip to a hunting reserve located in South Georgia. They catered for deer, hog, and even turkey hunts. Four of us headed out. A guide joined my friends. Josh loaned me a 243 Winchester, which he said was a good rifle for beginners. About two hours into the hunt, I was starting to get a bit flustered, bored out of my mind really, when, when our guide held his fist up, military style, I thought. He urged all of us to crouch low, I heard a rustle in the bushes off to our right, but straining to see anything, and suddenly, they came into view, a decent sized buck, leading two small deer, all three nibbling nervously at the grass around them. I couldn't breathe. What felt like waves of electricity coursed through me, and my adrenaline level spiked. The guide beckoned us forward, slowly. He whispered, Okay, boys, who's taking the shot? Josh and Peter had done this before, so they turned to me and said, All yours, buddy, with wistful smiles. At that same moment, the buck lifted his head. He'd heard or sensed something, and before we knew what was happening, he bolted. Without thinking, I stood up, worked the bolt action, instinctively tracked the path of the deer, and fired. It dropped. We later discovered that I had hit it just behind the left ear. It was a shot of at least a hundred yards at a moving target, and the guide was still boasting about it to his mates back at the main building. What no one knew was the total feeling of satisfaction, of utter accomplishment and peace that filled me. I had found my drug. I had found my calling. One thing led to another, and when the hunts no longer gave me the high I needed, I sought out a different type of satisfaction, fell in with the wrong sort of crowd, and the rest is history. I honed my skills, became adept in martial arts and skilled in the use of knives, swords, and bows, you name it. By the time I had reached 30, I had already taken out 10 targets, each purse bigger than the last. It was just what I did. And that brings me to what happened last fall and why I will never take another contract in my life. My intermediary set up the meeting. It was at a small cafe I knew in Jamaica, New York. It was just about twilight when I arrived and spotted my potential client seated well to the back. He was a fidgety old man, looked about sixty, hair all grey and cropped low, with a hat on the table in front of him. He wore a dark coat. It was a bit brisk after all, with winter just starting to spread its fingers. I walked over and stood at the table. Mr. Alexandra, I asked. He looked up, eyes darting from me to the other six or so customers in the cafe. In front of him was a cup of coffee, barely touched. He motioned for me to sit. I sat, staring at him in silence. As he was about to speak, however, the waitress came over. 
I ordered coffee myself and some apple pie. As she walked away, Alexandru followed her every step. Not a trusting fellow, I thought. He placed a folder in front of me. Mr. Stone, he rasped, this isn't your ordinary job, and I fear that you may take me a madman when I tell you of it, but I beg that you bear with me. I nodded and opened the folder. There was a photo of a very striking looking gentleman, looked to be in his forties, a touch of grey blended into his sideburns, he, he had a ruddy look, except for his full pink lips. And then there were the coal black eyes. He is known as Florin Propescu. I leaned back and stared at the man opposite me, who now seemed as pale as milk. He comes from Motherland, Romania. He has made quite a success for himself in America. But this is no ordinary businessman, Mr. Stone. Propescu is much, much more than that. He is a fiend, hell's own spawn, a vampire. It was only the genuine fear I saw on Alexandra's face that kept me from falling off my chair in a fit of laughter. Even so, I could not prevent the sides of my mouth from curling upwards. I cleared my throat and realized I made a strained sound when I did it. You think me a madman, a fool? A few screws loose, don't you, Mr. Stone? I shook my head. What I think, Mr. Alexandro, is that this is a damn joke, and I will strangle Jacobson for wasting my fucking time. I pushed my chair and I was about to leave when he pulled a small briefcase that he had kept out of view under the table. Looking around to make sure no one was looking in our direction, he popped it open. One million dollars, Mr. Stone. One million now, and one million when, if, you should complete your assignment. I paused, looked at the stacks of brand new Benjamins. He might be mad, but his money certainly looks good. I sat back down. Listen, you better not be jacking around with me. He shoved the case over. It's yours. And what is it you'd have of me? I questioned. Propescu took my daughter. It's been three weeks and I pray that she's dead. Because, Mr. Stone, there are worse things than death. He pushed over a picture of a stunning young woman, flowing dark hair, olive complexion and soft brown eyes. My Mariana, gone, taken away. What I want, Mr. Stone is for you to kill that beast once and for all. And if you should find my Mariana, and if she is like him, then put a stake into her heart as well. Did I just enter the fucking twilight zone? I wondered. The only thing keeping me there at that moment was that money. This dude had to be off his rocker. Certainly, he and this propescu individual had issues, and it seemed his daughter may have found herself a sugar daddy. Whatever happened, this poor old sot seemed to have lost his marbles completely. But hey, if he's paying, it's just another target. Easy money. Okay, Mr. Alexandra, you have a deal. I'll need some further details, and I expect to have the rest of my money ready upon completion. For the first time, he forced a tiny smile. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. And may God go with you. I don't think God wants anything to do with the likes of me, I thought. And as I walked away, I felt a hand grip my right arm. I turned to stare directly at Alexandru, who now stood himself. There are certain ways to kill Nosferatu, Mr. Stone. Your conventional methods won't work. Learn the ways, for there are many truths hidden inside the legends that Stoker and others have written. Wood and fire. I tugged my arm free and walked out the cafe. 
how I wish I had just followed my instinct and told the old fart to go jump off a building. It's three weeks later. Taking out a mark is like taking any other test. You need to prepare. So I did my research into Flora and Brebescia, a recluse but a rich one, which meant getting to him would not be easy. I tried to track his movements, learn his habits, but it was difficult. Trebescu hardly left his house, which was heavily guarded, and when he did, it was always in a heavily tinted SUV. He rarely patronized public restaurants and only occasionally appeared at social events, almost all after dark. Silly coincidence, I thought. Nothing I'd seen so far gave any credibility to Alexandra's fantasy that this man was a supernatural creature. Plus, there was no sign of his daughter. I pushed that garbage from my mind. I needed to focus. My opportunity came soon after. Propescu would be attending an open-air cocktail in Philly, starting again just after dusk. The event location was perfect. It stood well away from buildings with lots of trees to help me gauge wind directions and speeds. I chose to set up my nest in an abandoned apartment complex, which gave me easy access to the railway. A clean shot, and a quick escape. The shot would have to be from a distance of about 1200 yards, but with a little distraction, I wasn't worried. On the day of the event, I settled into my position early. I chose a 300 Winchester for the job. The target would be a little beyond the thousand yards that the Winchester is known for its accuracy. But with a few modifications, in my more than exceptional skill, I was confident that this was as easy as it gets. The guests started to arrive. The event was well lit. There were waiters milling around. The who's who came out in their finery. I lay about four feet from the window I had chosen. I was watching each guest walk in the entrance through my scope. The venture was almost filled and I had just started to think maybe my mark wouldn't show up. When there he was. Propescu wore a tall hat. He was decked in a flowing coat and had a fashionable walking stick carved from what might have been dark oak. He sported a neat bow tie and red shirt and was ushered in by two bodyguards, one on either side of him. He was one of those individuals you notice when they enter a room, and soon a line of admirers were floating over to him and shaking hands, a kiss here and there, a nod. Slowly, he faced my direction. I checked my indicators. Soon, he loomed in my sights. His face filled my scope. This was it. That familiar wave of electricity flowed through me. I controlled my breath. One, two, three. And as I pulled the trigger, I swear he looked right at me. Looked right at me and smiled. And then my slug tore an inch hole right in the middle of his forehead. I saw the gore burst from the exit wound, splattering a woman in a white gown just behind him. Then I packed my gun and ran. Sitting in the dark of the rail car I had jumped into, I replayed the incident over in my mind. Clean shot, right between the eyes. The target had gone down. Job over. So much for Alexandra's boogeyman. Later that night, I messaged Jacobson, informing him of the kill and letting him know that I expected the rest of the payment from our client. And then I went to bed. I could check the news tomorrow. My alarm went off at 6 a.m. As I rolled to turn it off, I saw the message alert light on my phone. I picked it up and saw numerous missed calls from Jacobson. I tossed the phone back on the bed, figuring I'd get to those after I brushed my teeth. I switched on the TV. Commercials were running, so I walked over to the bathroom, leaving the door open so I could hear the TV, and picked up my toothbrush. Soon, the anchor came on, and as expected, the story was all about the shooting. As he started reading the details, I choked and then gagged, almost throwing up. 
the words he said made no sense to me. And soon we will be joined live by New York's businessman, Florin Popescu. Mr. Popescu survived an attempt on his life at a social event in Philadelphia last night, but fortunately escaped with minor injuries. Minor fucking injuries, my ass, I said out loud and hustled over to the TV. The anchor held his left hand up to his ear. Okay, I'm being told now we have a live link with Mr. Popescu in his home. And there he was. Florin Popescu filled the split screen to the right of the presenter. He was sitting on a sofa in an ornately decorated parlor. Mr. Popescu, thank you for joining us. I barely heard the anchor speak. My heart was beating so hard in my chest I didn't hear the rest of what he asked. But then Popescu started to talk. It is not a problem. He said with a thick eastern accent. I willingly make myself available to you. I do not belong in the hiding. I do not believe in bowing to these cowards. Especially ones with such poor aim. I winced. He continued. We will give the police all our support because in the end we will find you dead shot. And you winked into the camera. Dead shot. What the fuck? That was the nickname my college buddies called me. Very few people knew that name. Maybe it was a coincidence, but I doubted it. Right then, in that moment, I believed it all. I believed what Alexandra told me. Whatever Propinchku was, he, he wasn't human. And now he had my scent. So once more, I ran. It's been two weeks since that day. Right now, I'm in a small motel in a little town called Leatham in Guyana. I've been in South America for a week now. I'm trying to get as far away from New York as possible. But last night I realized that it doesn't matter how far I go. It may not be far enough. Last night I was in the Guyanese capital of Georgetown. And as I was walking back to my hotel from getting supper, someone, something, came after me. My training is the only reason I'm alive right now. My training and the fact that I finally took Alexandra's advice and learned all I could about how to kill vampires. The wooden knife I planted into the creature's chest seemed to work. It screamed and slowly desiccated in front of me. Luminous eyes, fangs, and two-inch claws all testament that this was not a human. In life, it would have been a woman. Long, dark hair, features that resembled someone I would rather forget. Alexandra. Yes, so this was the fate that had befallen young Mariana. It was as her father had feared. Well, at least I completed part of what you asked, Alexandra. I thought to myself. I left Georgetown right at that moment and traveled ever deeper into the depths of Kiana, but they have my location now. And night is coming. I'm so alive. If you were wondering. For the most part, I've avoided the things that Popescu sent after me. Including the human ones. I killed one other creature after Marianna. And I'm not even sure what it was. A sort of half-breed, I think. Strong as hell. I emptied an entire clip from a 35-7 SIG into the bastard. And that barely slowed him down. But it slowed him down enough for me to sever head from spine with the two-foot wakazashi I carried under the back of my coat. That did the job. I've changed my hair color and grown a beard. There's also a fresh scar on my face. I have a busy few days south of the border. Before my encounter with the half-breed, I had carefully called in a couple favors, which led me to a modern-day armory in western Brazil. Let's call him Gnomes, and you won't find him online. He carters to a very niche market. From gnomes, I was able to get what I needed. A neat crossbow, small but powerful, complete with 20 bolts, carved from Brazilian iron wood. The bolts needed to be blessed and sanctified by submerging each in holy water. 
in order to be effective against Homo Nosferatu Vampiris. That's what I did with the wooden knife. If you don't do that, it was just wood. Thankfully, I was in a place where the church didn't ask too many questions once the donation was big enough. I smiled at the irony of it. I hadn't gone to church in 20 years, and when I finally did, it was for weapons to kill a vampire. Gnomes made me the wakazashi, along with the double-edged surugi. The swords were forged from spring steel, mixed with chromium and silicon, none of that silver bullshit, which is just too soft. Although, I confess, I did have gnomes make me a five-inch rounded silver dagger. I mean, we can't be too careful. Gnomes even found me a few rounds of incendiary ammo from my 357 sig. I knew I couldn't run forever. One of those things would get me eventually. There was only one way that this had any sort of positive ending. And if I had to die, I'd rather burn up than fade away, as they all say. In fact, with Repescu, I might be lucky if I died at all. But I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. There are always ways to move around. Secret networks forged over the years of covert dealings, whether by the cartels or by the government. You just needed the right access code and those pathways opened up, taking you wherever you needed to be. Which is how I ended up back in New York four days later, fresh credentials and all. I knew I couldn't get to Repescu directly. His estate was simply too heavily guarded. I had to draw him out. The prey would be luring out the predator. But there it was. It was what I had to do. I'm sure Propescu was unaware that I was back in the country, but I didn't think that would hold for long. I had the element of surprise for now, and whatever needed to be done, needed to be done quickly. In the three weeks before I took the shot that ended my career, I had studied Propescu's movements closely. There were few weaknesses to exploit. He had a regiment scheduled and was always surrounded by armed guards. Armed guards and the gaunt woman in the white dress. She was always there. Maybe not at Propescu's side, but always behind him, in the frame, or in the room. And always wearing white. Shit. Now that I thought about it, she was the woman who got spattered behind him when I blew his brains out. A shot that should have killed that son of a bitch. Maybe I had my leverage. I bided my time and surveilled the god woman. She would occasionally leave the property on her own, with two guards, sometimes one. She would do this during daylight hours also, so she could not be a vampire in the traditional sense. I did recall reading about familiars. These are humans who have pledged themselves to the service of a vampire. This precious gem of info I gleaned from, well, a graphic novel called Blade. Hey, I was in new territory and I was winging it, okay? Besides, didn't Alexandra say there were kernels of truth hidden within the legends? My plan was simple. I would take the gaunt woman and hope it was bait enough to draw a Grepescu. I had a safe space in Jersey where I could hunker down. This time I'd do the job right. It was a risk I was taking. A risk that she meant something to the vampire, but... What choice did I have? As we know all too well, however, plans don't always go the way you hope. My opportunity came as it happened. The very next day, a heavily tinted SUV left the compound with the gaunt woman in the back and with only one driver slash bodyguard. I jumped on the Harley Davidson Iron 1200 I had recently acquired and fell into pursuit. Propescu's compound was in the East Village and had been in his family since the early 19th centuries. Forty minutes later, the SUV pulled into an alley alongside a quaint apothecary shop in Queens. I drew up a bit past the alley, got off the bike, and quickly walked back. I got to the entrance just in time to see the gaunt woman enter a side door of the apothecary shop, while the driver slash bodyguard stood outside and waited. He was a big son of a bitch, but I've dealt with bigger. I just hoped he wasn't one of those half-breed things. I slipped quietly behind a dumpster where I could observe my quarry without being seen. About twenty minutes later, the gaunt woman emerged from the side door. 
a small paper bag in hand, and the door shut behind her. I moved quickly. I bolted towards the bodyguard, my 35-7 in hand. Even as he reached into his coat, I put one of his I put one in his heart and one dead center of his forehead. The incendiary's burnt flesh, but it was just flesh after all. And by the time he fell, I was already upon the gaunt woman. She was about to shout when I slammed the gun into the side of her head, and she crumpled, dropping the paper bag to the ground. I secured her wrists with plastic ties and searched through the guard's coat where I found a key fob to the SUV. I loaded the woman in and sped out the alley. Three blocks further down, I pulled into a small parking garage and jacked an old model Chevy. The gaunt woman was still out and I didn't want to take the chance that the SUV had GPS. It was an hour or so before sunset when I pulled into the seemingly abandoned building in an old Newark industrial area. I drove the Chevy into the garage and lowered the doors. This little flat cost me a lot of money. It looked old and run down from the outside but it boasted reinforced walls and doors, an encrypted communications and monitoring system, a small armory and CCTV covering every inch inside and out. I even had my own little holding cell where I deposited my guest. But now Robeski would know what had happened and shit was most certainly hitting the fan. I retrieved a small video camera and proceeded to record a short message featuring my guest prominently behind me. Florin, you undead asshole, I began. I have something that belongs to you, I said, hoping I hadn't pulled a blank. If you want to see her in one piece again, then here's what you must do. I sat mulling over my planned ambush. At the very worst, if he doesn't give a shit about the gaunt woman, I hope to piss him off enough that he would most certainly come from me. When I had finished, I uploaded and sent the message, though encrypted direct to the bastard's phone. Now for the hard part. Now I waited. A fluttering in my peripheral vision caused me to draw my sidearm and bring it about. The gaunt lady was up. She sat on the small cot of the 6 by 6 cell, wrists bound in front of her, and watched me. Welcome back, I said. Want some water? I picked up a bottle of water and slowly walked over to the cell, holding it out in front of me with my left hand, the pistol drawn but facing downwards in my right. Still, she only stared, and I swear the look on her face was starting to annoy the shit out of me. She was gaunt to the point of being almost skeleton, pale hair pulled back in a bun and tied. She had striking Native American features and shallow skin. It was difficult to determine her age. She could be twenty or forty. Her black eyes followed my every move, and still she remained silent. I walked up to the small opening in the front door of the cell and tossed the water, some primitive fear in the back of my mind that she'd spring at me with preternatural speed. Nothing happened. She just stared, didn't even fidget when the bottle landed on the cot. She watched me the way you'd look at a dog that had been nabbed by dog catchers. Pitying. I almost shot her right there. The minutes went by, slowly, agonizingly. I sat on the stool facing the cell, back against the wall and closed my eyes. I didn't even realize I had drifted close to sleep when a voice from in front of me startled me awake. I fell off the stool, rolled once to the right, and came up with my sig in both hands, trained at the cell. The woman was standing now, holding on the bars. Her eyes were turned up, only white showing, but that wasn't the strangest thing. It was the voice. From her mouth came an unnatural sound, a mixture between a man and a woman's voice, but the accent I'd heard before. Florin Propescu. Mr. Storm, I don't know whether to be angry or impressed. You have shown yourself to be both courageous and resourceful. If somewhat of a fool, you should know this only has one ending, Mr. Stone, and it's not a happy one. Not for you. In fact, there was a pause. I meant to give you my personal attention for that bullet you put in my head. 
a sigh, then. Juliet, whose company you now keep, is dear to me, yes, but not so dear as to be irreplaceable. Mr. Stone, maybe you should answer your door. Propescu's puppet smiled. Shit. I had been so focused on the strange voice coming from the gaunt woman, I didn't notice the monitors. Even as she slumped to the floor of the cell, Propescu having taken his leave, I saw that I had problems. So the gaunt woman was linked to the vampire. Kind of human GPS. My bad for not having thoughts of something like that, but again, this was all new to me. I saw one of those black SUVs pull up to the house. Two of Rebescu's goons got out. Just two, Florin? Well, as they say, pride goeth before a fall. One of them opened the back door and out stepped Rebescu himself. He was dressed in a dark, sleek suit, complete with a red shirt and a black tie, dark glasses on, and carrying the same walking stick I had seen before. He had black, shoulder-length hair slicked back, colored with flecks of gray. He stared at the camera and smiled, a smile surely designed to display the fangs that filled his mouth, not two, as some of those old vampire movies featured. Instead, his mouth seemed brimming with teeth. Well, at least I got you out of your stinking hole, you bastard. The air was suddenly filled with some weird chattering in a language I'd never heard. It was like breaking glass searing into my brain. The gaunt woman was back on her feet, staring directly at me, and where her eyes were white before, now there was only blackness. She seemed to be mouthing some indication, and I could feel myself starting to swoon. I fell to my knees, shaking my head hard. It cleared enough that I saw the crossbow on the table in front of me. Instinct took over. I loaded, turned, and fired, all in one motion, and from less than eight feet away, the ironwood bolt crunched into her chest. She staggered backward. I reloaded and pumped two more bolts into her. Thick black blood spurted from the wounds. It had a sickly, foul smell making me gag. I was just about to fire another bolt when I saw her shudder uncontrollably with an unnatural violence. Then, she fell flat on her back, eyes glossing over, the same black goo running from the sides of her mouth. I knew she was dead when I heard the howl from outside. It was animalistic, wolf-like, a howl of pain and rage mixed into one. And I knew Brobescu was coming for me, coming for me right now. I slung the siguri across my back and tied the wakizashi down my left thigh. The wooden dagger was strapped across the left side of my chest and the sig was tucked into the small of my back. I carried the crossbow in my hands. I had a number of other weapons in the small armory I kept, but I'm not sure what good they would do. I did retrieve a couple of frag grenades though and slipped them into my pocket. Well, if this was to be the end, then I would make it one bloody son of a bitch. There was a heavy thud at the door to the rear where the small kitchenette was. This was followed by a steady pounding. That door was made of one inch reinforced steel, but it sounded like the biggest sledgehammer in the world was being thrown at it. I sprinted to the door and slid open the four inch square peephole I had built into it. I poked the sig through and held down the trigger, sending a full clip of incendiaries into the hulking bastard staring at me. I slammed the peephole shut and looked back at the monitor covering the back of the house to see the creature clutching at what was left of his face. There were flames bursting through his fingers, and soon his entire head exploded. I smiled with grim satisfaction, but that had been my last clip of incendiary. Almost before the thing hit the ground, his place had been taken by the other one. There was no sign of Propescu. Suddenly, silence. The pounding stopped, leaving only a ringing in my ears. I looked at the monitors. I could see no one. Then, one by one, the camera started to go down. Soon, I was staring at black monitors, 
The bastards had taken away my electronic eyes. I was still brooding over this when I heard an explosion from the back, just as a rush of air slammed me against the wall. Stunned, I scrambled to a crouching position, my brain finally registering that one of those animals had brought along some good old C4. The smoke was still clearing when unnatural goon number two came rushing in. He was big, over six feet tall, and although he too wore a dark suit, it was easy to tell he was built like the rock under it. His eyes, though, they were as black as those of Juliet, who now lay in a bloody mess in the cell. He spotted me crouching in the corner and moved like lightning. The crossbow was still in my hand and I fired. He took it to the chest but kept coming. Before I could reload, I felt clammy but powerful fingers close on my shoulders and I was lifted up and flung across the room. I smashed into the table holding the monitor equipment, sending sparks and electronics flying everywhere. I lost my grip on the crossbow. I could feel something warm starting to flow down the side of my head, soaking into my new beard. My bottom lip was torn open and a lump was already rising on the top of my head. He came at me again. The goon was raining blows down on me and I was only just managing to fend them off when one landed on the left side of my face. Stars swam before me as I felt the bone crunch. I pulled my leg up under me and kicked out, sending the bastard whirling. Blood flown from my face now. It was a minor respite, but it allowed me to yank the wakazashi free of its scabbard. Snarling, he came at me again, flexing the fingers in both hands, and as he pounced upon me, I brought the short sword up. It impaled him through the abdomen, exiting from his upper back. The man-thing snarled at me, baring his teeth and I twisted the blade, working it back and forth. It got his attention. He pulled away, the blade coming free with a sucking, popping sound. I tried to move in for the kill, but my left leg gave in from under me and I almost fell over. There was a deep gash just above the knee. It saved my life. The creature slashed at the empty air where my head was a moment before. Its momentum carried it past me and I seized the chance. Dropping the short sword, I drew the siguri from across my back and brought the double-edged blade up to meet its neck. The cut was clean. The head went spinning in a corner while the rest of its body convulsed on the floor, spewing that black, foul substance all over me. This time, I did throw up. I had just brought my hand up to wipe my mouth when the world erupted into a blinding light, followed only by blackness. I awoke to the smell of smoke, putrescine and blood. I was lying on the asphalt behind my now breached stronghold. Black gore smeared me, mixed with my own blood. The dark sky loomed overhead. There were stars out. It was as good a night to die as any, I thought. And then the pain laced through what felt like my entire body. I winced and brought my hand up to my head slowly sitting up. I was aware of a dark shadow off to my left, but I was not going to give that son of a bitch the pleasure of seeing me weak. It took great effort, but I eventually got to my feet. From behind me came a chuckle. Mr. Stone, so much effort. For what? You think you accomplished something? I felt a whoosh and suddenly he was in front of me, barely one foot away. His mouth seemed unnaturally wide, dozens of sharp serrated teeth peering out as he opened and closed it. His complexion was pallid, only the red lips stood out. His eyes were dog-like, changing color it seemed from yellow to red to orange. He smelled great though. What was that? Chanel Grand? His breath was another story altogether. It smelled of decay. Well, Mr. Stone, he said, his voice rising in pitch. You have my attention. This is what you want, is it? The eyes were now tiny points of red, the mouth convulsed, becoming almost snout-like. 
there was a slimy drool running down the sides. I retreated. One step. Two. Three. And he was upon me. I threw myself back, but his arms enveloped me, pinning my left arm to my body. And as we both fell, I felt those teeth sink into my left shoulder. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. My throat locked by a terror I'd never known. God help me. For all my adult life, I had avoided taking up your name and I don't deserve an ounce of your pity, Lord, but the pain, it was excruciating. Tears welled up in my eyes and I felt them run down my cheek. It was as if someone was sawing into my shoulder while pouring acid into the wound at the same time. The slurping sounds almost made me throw up again. That was my blood, my life being drawn out. Propescu pulled his head away, lifted it high up in the sky, and inhaled deeply as I felt bits of flesh go with it. The next time he brought it down, it would be to take my life. Desperately, I reached out with my free right hand, and then I remembered like a bulb in my head. I brought up my right leg and reached into the boot. I looked up to see that cavern of teeth dip towards me once more, but instead of finding flesh, it found five inches of silver dagger, buried to the hilt from under the chin up to the brain. The vampire screamed. It screamed, and blood flowed from its mouth. The edges of the wound simmered like someone thrown bacon into very hot oil. Propescu pushed himself off and away from me, and grabbed at the dagger with fingers that I resembled seven-inch talons. He could not get a decent grip and screamed again. The dagger hurt him but it did not look like it would kill the creature. With every ounce of effort, I stood up. He was starting to work it free. I felt panic coming on, but then I felt something else. Something that was burning the left side of my chest. I shook away the cobwebs. It was the wooden dagger, blessed and sanctified by a South American priest, baptized by the blood of Mariana. I drew it out, just in time to see the vampire turn. He'd gotten the silver dagger out, and he wanted to finish this. I drew a deep breath and anticipated his lunge. I opened my body up, letting his momentum bring him into me, and I drove the wooden blade into his heart. That's from Ariana, you fucking devil. I screamed as I threw myself to the ground and rolled as far as I could. Propescu had carried on a few feet past me, so I could not see his face. He appeared to be clutching at his chest, but strangest of all, he made no sound. Not like when I stabbed him with the silver dagger. My heart fell, hopelessness creeping in. Did I miss? I was just about to resign myself that there was nothing more I could do. When it came, it started softly at first, like a kettle building up steam. But soon, I had to cover my ears. The scream was unearthly, reaching a pitch no normal creature could attain. I saw Propescu began to shudder violently, with what looked like pieces of him flying in all directions. Slowly, he started sinking to the ground like one of those blown up plastic men when you let the air out. Then the smell hit me, like all the putrid things rolled into one, and for the second time that night, I threw up. Propescu was laying flat now, and even as he melted, he turned his head to me. Hate in those red eyes, but it was a dimming light. The skin and flesh started falling off the face, running like a thick mixture. Soon, I saw the skull and the rows of teeth decaying now. Teeth that had left a hole on my left shoulder and had taken how many countless lives. Soon, there was nothing but black dust, swept away by the night wind. And so, the vampire Propescu met its end in a semi-abandoned old industrial complex in Newark, New Jersey. I heard sirens off in the distance. Maybe our little escapade had gotten someone's attention. I tossed both grenades into the safe house and ducked behind the SUV as they went off. The fire would hopefully destroy anything incriminating. It was the best I could do right now. I slipped behind the wheel and texted Jacobson, my intermediary. 
It was just before dawn when I pulled into the driveway of the house on 104th Avenue. I got out of the black SUV I was driving and slowly, painfully, walking up to the front door. I had patched up my shoulder and leg as best as I could, but I had lost a lot of blood, and I felt as if I'd been run over by a train. By two trains, actually. The sun broke over the horizon, pushing away the darkness. I suppose in time I'd find out which one of those stories was true, whether you turned when you were bitten or whether you had to ingest the blood of the vampire. For now, I just enjoyed the light on my face. There were certain matters to attend to, however, and I rang the doorbell. Who is it? It came from the intercom at the side of the door. Good morning, I said. This is John Stone, Mr. Alexandro, and I believe that you owe me a million dollars.